Thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see how many people have come for this important topic, this homage to Henri Corbin. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. I will try to do my best for the coming hour to say something about spiritual chivalry in the battle for the angel. By the way, you're having a spiritual experience right now. We're constantly looking for spiritual experiences, very often. But the fact that you're sitting here aware of each other and of what's going on here, more or less, is a spiritual experience. Because without the presence of spirit and the creative imagination that goes with it, there would be no experience at all. So it's, I was very um, uh, happy with that leek soup example. <laughs> because one of the ways that the esoteric truly remains esoteric is by being blatantly in the public. And we don't see it. And I think one of the things that Henri Corbin wants to convey to us is that the loss of the soul and the loss of the spirit or the loss of the munus imaginalis or the loss of the symbolical and the imaginal and the loss of the archetypal and the world of ideas means also the loss of this world. We don't see it that way because we have constantly the feeling that we're constantly exposed to the world. We see objects around us, we see human beings around us and you're telling me I'm not looking at the world, I'm not experiencing the world. Yes, that is what Henri Corbin would try to tell us. You think you're awake, you think you're experiencing nature and the world, but the world has first to unveil itself, express itself. It is as if we have to be patient and careful and loving enough in order that the world may show its face. We see the world, but it does not have a face. It has become objectified, hence fossilized, and that means that we become an object ourselves. And we think objects exist in their own right. That's what Husserl and Heidegger call our natural attitude. Our natural attitude is looking at human beings, looking at the world, at nature as out there. And because it's out there, we can investigate it, comprehend it, analyze it. But the major thing we forget is that there is a looker in the first place, that the world shows itself in our awareness, in the space we are, in our soul, if you want. In that sense, Corbin says, but correct me, Tom, if I'm quoting him wrong, there is no physics outside of the psychic. He says things like that. It doesn't mean that everything is projected by us, but every phenomenal experience, by being a phenomenal experience, including the experience of an electron, an atom, a cell, is an experience by a human being. Now, that human being can have the intentionality of an artist, a housewife, a priest, a mystic, and it's that intentionality, a kind of questioning of the world, that makes the world giving you a different answer. And we forget that looking at the world as an object is a specific answer reality gives to us to a question we ask, namely, which question, what is it? And that's the beginning of Aristotelian metaphysics. What is reality? What are the building blocks? But I hope you see that the question itself, what is it, already channels us to a specific answer, namely an object. You're looking for the ultimate substance of something. And that's the origination of what you could call substance metaphysics, which goes from Aristotle to Thomas of Aquino and in the scholastics. So even the question, what is it, already betrays a worldview. And because you ask what, only an answer adapted to that question will unveil itself. That's not a wrong answer. Nothing that I'm going to say is critique towards science, if I'm going to say anything about science. But it could be a critique towards scientism, namely thinking that the answers to the question, what is something, what am I, what are you, is the only answer, and hence also the only question, that could be raised. Imagine that we would start our philosophy with the question, not with what is something, but with the question, who is he or she, if you look at a tree? Just asking who. The interesting thing is, may you, you may experience that already now, if you would ask when you walk through a forest to a tree, who are you, that almost shortcuts your brain. 
The advantage, but the risk of a what question is that that provokes a further what question. You can ask what is a cell and then you see its building blocks and you see further parts of the cell and then you can ask what again and what again until you're at a quantum level. And that's magic in itself. But the interesting thing is if you ask the question who is the world instead of what is the world? Who is God? In my experience instead of what is God? That who's, if that's an English word, who's, not what's, are irreducible. You can not analyze and reduce a who. If you would do that, it becomes a what. Do you follow my drift? So you can imagine a who, you can experience a who, you can love a who, you can hate a who. You can understand a who, but not solely by analysis. Now, now I've said something in five minutes that I didn't intend to say. <laughs> What I intended to say was this slide, why Henri Corbert and why personal transfiguration, one of the parts of the title of the whole day. Well, Porte already gave an answer, I think, to this question, so in this case the answer preceded these questions. I think, as Tom already made clear, the major concern or one of the major concerns of Henri Corbert's work and legacy is he was a very anxious, and I think he's more topical than ever before in this day and age, for the cultural development already starting in the late Middle Ages and increasing after the Enlightenment with modernity, that we uh, lost our personhood, our sense of personhood, our sense of subjectivity. With that I mean being a subject, not in an objectified sense, but in a relational sense, because what makes us into saying I, also on the purely personal ephemeral level is because we have a relationship with a Tao. You cannot have an I without a Tao and a Tao cannot exist without an I. We are relational beings also purely on a horizontal level. Because let's look how a personality or ordinary psychological makeup comes into existence. If we would be left in to uh, outside of the human context, we would be biological human beings after we were born. But if we would not be raised into humanhood, we would not have a personality. You know these stories of wolf children and Tarzan the ape man. So we may be biologically human beings, DNA wise, but if we are not exposed and interact with other human beings, we will not develop a personality. That shows that personality is not a a thing on its own. We are persons, purely horizontal, because we have horizontal relationships. What Henri Corbin was worried about is that the whole notion of personhood, both horizontally but also spiritually, namely that we are a person in the eyes of God, or that we forget that a tree can be a person and can show itself as a person or an angel, that that development would go in a direction that would lead to a complete dehumanization and depersonalization of ourselves and of nature. Now it's a long story to explain which theological, philosophical, historical arguments he gives why the Western history developed that way. Then you have to refer to the distinction between Avicenna and Averroes and how that influenced Christian theology. I'm not going into that. What is important is that he was really fixated on that question. We need personal transfiguration. And with that, he did not mean just the mere transformation of our personalities. That's part of the work, and an important part of the work. But he meant that we have to transfigurate from personalities horizontally in becoming persons vertically. And these are two different notions. And for that we need a personal relationship with that which transcends us as personality, not to get rid of our personality, not to get rid of the world, but in order that the transcendent may be embodied on, in us, through us. Tom alluded with the difficulty of the words of transcendence and immanence. I think what combines the two together is personhood. Only in a genuine person, the transcendent becomes imminent, and the imminent is always pointing to the transcendent. And only in our logical thinking, we want one thing and the other, after each other, but that's not reality, it's at the same time. 
D did that make sense, more or less, what I'm saying? Because I'm just babbling now. <laughs> that he found that important for himself to become a true person, to be reborn, so to speak. A spiritual rebirth is clear from an important quote he gives on what it means to be a true philosopher. It's one of my favorite quotes. He says, to be a philosopher is to take the road, never setting down in some place of satisfaction with a theory of the world. Not even a place of reformation, nor of some illusory transformation of the conditions of this world. So, he says, a genuine philosopher is not primarily interested in ideological ideals, in changing society, or in religious reformation. Because why not? Because you're still trying to do the transformation from a specific natural attitude that what has to be changed is out there as an object. Forgetting that what has to be transformed must necessarily also be part of the transformer <laughs> and the one who wants to transform. So he says a general philosopher cannot start with outward transformation. He doesn't say outward transformation is unnecessary, of course. But already calling outward transformation outward transformation shows that you're unconsciously working from a subject-object divide. That's what, what he's saying. So what has to be done, he continues, a true philosopher aims for self-transformation, for the inner metamorphosis which is implied by the notion of a new or spiritual rebirth. And like Christ says in his dialogue with Nicodemus, you have to be reborn from water and spirit. The adventure of the mystical philosopher is essentially seen as a voyage which progresses towards the light. Here, already in the last sentence, you can see an allusion to spiritual chivalry. Because if you're talking about an adventurous journey towards the light, towards the Orient, then we can see that as a journey towards the Holy Grail or towards heavenly Jerusalem. We already see an allusion to knighthood. Being a genuine philosopher for him is also being a spiritual knight, fighting the forces of darkness inside ourselves and outside ourselves, not with hate, not with incomprehension, but by bringing these forces into light within a perspective that they can be redeemed. Philosophically speaking, he would criticize modern secular consciousness simply as being purely horizontal. And even spirituality becomes horizontal as a question of spiritual evolution from past to future. What is typical for horizontality is literalism. Taking things only at first sight as they present themselves without being patient enough what they have to tell you. Horizontality is what René Guénon called the reign of quantity uh, in his famous book. Not that Corbin completely agreed with the traditionalists like Guénon and Chouan, but I think on that point uh, uh, Corbin would, would, would agree. We are obsessed with the reign of quantity. Not only in our consumerism, that's only the blatant extreme form of it, but in our way of thinking and approaching reality. Again, we are asking what questions. If you ask what, you're, it refers not to quality, but to quantities. We want to measure everything. And we experience ourselves as entrapped in a world of quantity. Space is something that confines us or that has to be bigger to free us. And time is something that has a past and a future. We cannot go back to the past and the future remains very uncertain. So the fact that we feel estranged and a stranger in this world is already, according to Corbin, an intuition that we are not of this world. You know, if you put an animal in a cage, it would feel resistance. It will not feel at home. The interesting thing about the human species is that it doesn't always feel at home in what, according to materialistic philosophy, should be its home, namely this world. <laughs> there, a lot of spiritual traditions try to convey one way or the other this world, whether it's Plato's cave or another imagery, is not the only real thing. Now, whether that means that the cave has no reason for existence and is an illusion is something else. I think that's the wrong conclusion. I think one misreads Plato with that. But I do, I do hope you recognize that the idea of 
feeling as being estranged, feeling a stranger, has to do with that horizontality. There is a vertical dimension in us which could be called soul or spirit, which is not the same thing, that screams to be heard, to be listened to, to be acknowledged. And all spiritual traditions point that out, that there is a vertical tradition, not subjugated to quantities, to past and future, where time is cyclical, or where eternity rules, not horizontal time. And where qualities exist, which means, in easy terms, you have higher and lower. Let me explain that. And it's funny that Tom spoke about two arrows at the same time because I tried to draw them. If you look at the vertical dimension, again, you could call that soul and spirit. It has an upward direction, namely, for example, in our prayer life, in our meditations, but also in the prayer of the heliotrope, singing to the sun, or the crying of the wolf at full moon. But why does it do that? Why does everything pray to the above, even when we don't know the word prayer. Because prayer, as any genuine mystic would say, is a response. The initiative of prayer does not begin with us. The initiative with prayer comes from the divine, who, for example, in Islam, raises the question, who is your Lord? And then the covenant is made between mankind before a mankind becomes embodied and Allah because they say, you are the Lord. Prayer is not so much asking for something, but receiving the capacity to listen what the addressant has to say. But a prayerful attitude is there for a twofold movement, upwards and downwards. But the whole creation is a descent, a revelation. Sacred scripture is a revelation. The Quran is a revelation. The Bible is a revelation. The Upanishads, the Vedas are a revelation. That's a descent of the divine. And we reading that, being touched by that, sharing that, honoring that, is an ascent. So what seems from the above to be a descent is from our perspective an ascent. And you cannot say it's either or the other. It's both at the same time. Which also means that we can live below a level of our human vocation, and all traditions have called that a fall. Now, not a fall that happened zillions of years ago, but a fall that could happen now. From moment to moment, we could live under our human vocation. In that sense, even being worse than animals. And I think we have a lot of examples in our own life and in history that shows that. But that is not necessarily an eternal state. Because even below the horizon, there is the tendency to go up. So I want to give to you that if Corbin talks about higher and higher keys and transcendent, you cannot disconnect that from, at the same time, stressing the importance of imminence. So I was very happy that that was a, a part of, of your lecture. In other words, what he says is, we are disoriented. That's an interesting word. It means we have lost the Orient. And the Orient in mystical thinking is not a geographical direction. It's a metaphysical direction of where your gaze is, where your heart is directed towards. It's upwards. And the Occident, what Surawardi calls, in the end, the most important teacher next to Ibn Arabi of Henri Corbin, what Surawardi calls the Occidental exile. We recognize that even in the story of the prodigal son, which I think has some reminiscences with the hymn of the pearl, for example, in the Acts of Thomas, where a prince, maybe you know that story, that Gnostic hymn, where a prince leaves his fatherly home, gets into Egypt, immersed into Egypt to, to, to find a pearl of light, and then to go back to his spiritual ancestry vertically, and there he meets his heavenly twin, his brother who was left there. You know that, that hymn is a very famous hymn in Gnostic uh, thinking. The return of the prodigal, 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 I'm sorry, my English is not, I'm not a native speaker, so uh, I'm Belgium, so we have to forgive if sometimes the words are not pronounced correctly. The pro prodigal, pro prodigal, prodigal son. It's the same story. It's prodigal son is someone who has been completely immersed in identifications 
and has to be freed and longs to go back to his heavenly father, back to the Orient. So what Corbin is dealing with is he tries to tell us we have to, and for him personally that meant rediscovering the cosmology and the anthropology and hence also the angelology, and I come to that later of course, of Iranian mysticism and Zoroastrian uh, cosmology. For him that opened up well, a treasury of answers to deal with the human predicament of completely obsessed by horizontality. So what he says is we've lost the traditional worldview, which is quite universal. You can find it with the Neoplatonists but, and in Hindu thinking. But what Corbin was found important is that with Surawardi, Ibn Arabi, Masdian cosmology, abstractions became personal. And that was, I think, the thing he was most worried about that even cosmology can become pure abstract metaphysics and he didn't, he, he, he saw that that was not a good direction to follow, not to revive abstract theology but to re-unveil esoteric cosmology which is always about beings, not about abstract ideas. So let's continue a little bit what that worldview was. He says, well, quoting Surawardi, we have of course the sensible world, the world we think we live in. And then surrounding that, and I like the image of surrounding instead of only going upwards, is the world of the soul, the imaginal. You could call these the lower heavens. In Jewish Kabbalah, this would be called the lower heavens, Yetzirah in Kabbalah. And then we have the world of spirit, which is the platonic world of ideas. Now the issue is, and for him that was a revelation, the sensible world is quite concrete. You have a concrete tree, concrete flowers, concrete glass, concrete human beings. But the world of ideas is quite abstract. The idea of good, the idea of beauty, the idea of justice. You see there is something missing linking the purely abstract truth with a concrete but very perishable phenomenal world. And he found in Surawadi the answer, it's the world of the soul about which Plotinus does not give much information what that consists of. But people like Surawardi and Ibn Arabi are mostly writing about the world of the soul. Now you would say, isn't that strange because it's only in the middle. Well, it's because in the middle that it's the most important because the world of the soul is the only plane of existence that connects spirit and body. It's the plane where you have concreteness, but not physical, but imaginal, symbolical. And it's the plane, the world, where you have truth, good and beauty, but not abstract, but embodied. Or as Surawardi himself says, the world of the soul, of the imaginal, is where the spiritual realities become embodied and the physical realities can become spiritualized. And this image makes clear that the journey upwards from the sensible world to the imaginal world includes the sensible world because you then experience the sensible world from being rooted in the world of the soul instead of looking at trees and human beings as merely objects. So the idea of transcendence in this cosmology implies becoming more embodied. Is, do I make myself more or less clear? But embodied in an imaginal way, not in an object, objectifying way. Now this would be the ideal picture. So the imaginal world, what does it consist of? Let me take a very concrete example. You go into a forest and you see trees, oak trees. And you have zillions of oak trees in the whole world. But they do embody <coughs> quantitatively the oak tree, which is different than the willow. Willow is a tree, yeah? Yeah, okay. Now the idea of the oak tree would exist in the world of spirit. Do you see there is a gap, a metaphysical gap, a reality missing between the idea of the oak tree or the idea of the tulip or the idea of the lotus or the idea of the rose or the idea of the flower and the concrete roses, lotuses, trees we see. That gap is filled by the symbolical flower, the symbolical tree. So which trees would we be experiencing in the imaginal? The trees we find in mythology, Yggdrasil, the tree of life the tree of knowledge and evil. Every mythology speaks about sacred trees. What does a tree stand for? A tree is a bridge between heaven and earth. That's why in the Psalms, 
the tzaddikim, the righteous ones, are called trees. And maybe Tolkien has sensed an intuition of that because there is a scene in the Lord of the Rings where you have those walking trees who talk very slow and long about things, unlike me. Yeah? Um, so we, in the imaginary world, trees exist. Mountains exist. Mount Arunachala is a tree in India. You know, the famous mountain to which Ramana Maharshi has made beautiful hymns. It's interesting that in one of his talks, Ramana says, that mountain is inhabited by gods and divine beings inside. Now, if you would interest that, oh, that's interesting. Let's, let's mine into mountain Arunachala and see whether there are little goblins there and elves and you will not find it. You will find maybe gold or other materials, but you will not find the gods and the divine beings that Ramana Maharshi is talking about. But Ramana Maharshi sees in the physical Arunachala, Shiva, the embodiment of the god Shiva, and all the aspects of Shiva that are, so to speak, part of his family. And that's not imaginary, no. One can be assured that Ramana Maharshi really experiences Mount Arunachala that way. What do you else find in the imaginary world? Well, the embodiment of the archetype you are intended to be. Because the gap between an ordinary tree and the idea of a tree, we have a similar gap for ourselves. The gap between me as a personality and what could be called the idea God has about me in his divine mind. The archetype that pre-existed before I was physically born, or as a Zen Buddhist would say, the face I have before I was born. But it's an archetypal idea. Now, where can that get embodied in the imaginal? But how can it become embodied if I become aware of the imaginal and try to imagine myself, not with fantasy, but with following an honest, authentic spiritual path towards that archetype, towards my heavenly twin, as we will see. And in the world of the imaginal, the archetype I'm destined to be, my fatum in a positive sense, and the personality will meet. That meeting you can call the angel. An angel is a relationship with God. And I'm going to try to explain that for the remaining time. We think about our soul, ourselves, and the angel as two entities that pre-exist and then have a relationship. We have to stop thinking and using substance metaphysics. Not substances exist separate from each other. Yes, conceptually. But beings exist because they are constituted by their relationships. I think that's one of the major truths of Buddhism. When they say there is no self, there, are, there is no individual solid entity, like the Gart, the Gart told, I think, therefore I am. They're right. But we cannot deny our personhood, or our personality, or our beinghood. So what constitutes being a person? Relationality. And instead of saying you have an angel, and you have the soul, and they have a relationship, it's the relationship that constitutes both at the same time. And that's difficult for an analytical mind to get. And I'll try to explain that. Because that relationship is a chiv chivalric, chivalric. chivalric relationship. Like Dante had with Beatrice or Vladimir Solovyov had with Sofia. So this would be the ideal situation. But we are not in an ideal situation according to Suravardi and his teachers, his spiritualists. We are living below the horizon in a kind of an underworld, which mythology calls hells, or talas in Hinduism. Above you have lokas, below you have talas. Above you have heavens, below you have hells. And again, these are not geographical locations. These are mythological, imaginal locations that are real in human experience. And you could say that we live in the sensible world if we are present. If you walk through a forest and you're thinking about your groceries or you're looking at the trees as objects to be cut down, then you're really not living in a sensible world according to Corbin. You think you are, but you're just an object surrounded by objects. You're only in the sensible world 
outside of the cave, so to speak, Plato would say, if you're present, if you're aware, if you allow the surroundings to be interiorized, to be presenting themselves in your awareness, then you're in the sensible world. That's quite a shocking message, I think, for myself at least. Namely, that teaches me that I'm mostly not present here. I'm not enjoying the leek soup. I'm commenting on it, positively, negatively, but I do not let the taste of the leek soup express itself, whether I like the taste or not. I'm in a human conversation, now maybe I'm looking at you. Am I really present here or just enjoying myself speaking? If the latter is the case, there will not be much inspiration, I think. Any dialogue with a human being or with another creature implies being present. Also bodily being present. Not there, but here. If we are not present, we are not oriented, Corbeil would say. We are fragmented. We are constantly passive to the impulses that are the input of our life. Maybe beautiful impulses, most of the time unfortunately not. So we're really living in a world which we think is a sensible world, nature, but it's really a world of conditioning when we are asleep, in exile. Somewhere in one of his most difficult books, Temple and Contemplation, he says, if the above is the temple, the cosmos as a temple, we are really living here. Well, if the above is a temple, then this is a crypt. We are living below the floor of a church. You know how a church is. If you enter a church, you would add symbol. Let's imagine a church or any temple. You first have, before you go to the holy place, a, 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 a preparatory space. You know, you enter the church. That symbolizes this sensible world. Then you go to the holy, like in a Jewish temple, the holy. And then you have behind it the holy of the holy, the sanctum sanctorum. That's these three things. Symbolically, any temple, think of the Borobudur, you know the Borobudur, the, Buddha, the, the Buddhist structure in Java, has three layers. Kama Loka, our world. Rupa Loka, the imaginal. Arupa Loka, the formless world of ideas. Imagine doing a pilgrimage in the Borobudur. You go through that whole architecture spiritually, you will be coming back down, completely transformed. We are not doing that. We are living most of the time, unfortunately, here. Like when you lose yourself in a map, you want to know where you are. Like in London, when I lost my way, you want to know to, to find a map. And where are you? Oh, well, maybe in uh, uh, Euston Road or uh, that station. Well, cosmologically speaking, most of the time we are here. And the whole concern of Corbin is getting us first here in order to open ourselves for the imaginal and the spirit to become really human as we are intended to be, and that will transfigure the world. I hope that's more or less clear. Yes? Okay. Another way of saying this, I'm going to try that, to do that, our human condition as Corbin envisioned that with a parable of famous uh, 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 recovery story in the New Testament. I quote from Luke, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus, and listen attentively because it's an important statement I find and it's a very touching statement, literally touching statement. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her. He touches her. It's physical. Although this is an event of the soul, which can happen in all of us. And immediately she straightened up and praised God. According to some mystics, this parable in visionary imagery describes not a physical occurrence, but an event of the soul. Namely, that we are so curved into ourselves. The Latin expression is, and Luther has adopted that later, we are in curvatus in se. We are curved in upon ourselves. 
narcissistic. If we ask ourselves, who am I? We are not looking outward. We are looking solely inward. Well, you can only do that if you start to divide reality between outward and inward. That's interesting in itself. Look at the position, the position of that woman. She is not straightened up. She's not vertical, like original man in paradise. She cannot be receptive for the heavens, for the imaginal. And look at the setting where it happens. It's on a Sabbath, in a synagogue, in a sacred place. She, he is surrounded and she is surrounded by Pharisees, literalists, who blame Jesus, not only this occasion, but in many other occasions. What are you doing? You're healing on a Sabbath day. According to St. Augustine, not exactly an esoteric, I would say, <laughs> she mirrors the mental state of the Pharisees, namely one of horizontalism and literalism. She can only look at the ground. But she's also not capable of looking at her savior, which in this image is Christ. You could replace that with an angel or any face God wants to show to you. And that's why the parable says, he saw her. Now the Greek is very important. The Greek word used is not seeing instead of looking at an object, but noticing. I hope you see the difference. Some people you can look at, but they don't feel that they are noticed, that they are accepted, that they are in a dialogue. When it's stated in that simple word, he saw her, it meant for her that it was the first time that she was really acknowledged and that her condition was being recognized and acknowledged. And he had to touch her personally in order that she could straighten up. And the first thing what she does, praising God. Not even Christ. Praising God. Why? Because man is in his original vocation intended to be a prayerful being and a praising being. As in the Quran is stated, Allah says, I am the rich, you are poor. Meaning, you get everything from God. Kurban says we are intrinsically mystical poor people. We, we, we are, we, we are, we, mystical poverty is not something we can achieve. Mystical poverty is a realization that you didn't have anything in the first place and that everything is a gift. She realizes that. And she can straighten up. So in that Cosmological scheme, you could say she leaves the crypt and finally becomes truly human. Isn't that beautiful? So, the current version of this parable would be this one. <laughs> That's how most people walk around these days. <laughs> and trying to find themselves on that screen. Likes, how many likes do I have? And if they take pictures, they call it selfies. No, it would be at least honest if you would take a picture of yourself and call it bodies. That, 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 that makes sense. But taking a picture of yourself and calling it a selfie already shows that the word self really doesn't mean anything anymore. It's reducing the notion of personhood and selfhood to an image. Well, that's purely narcissism. Or the modern variant. <laughs> Well, I'm more busy with these pictures than with preparing the lecture, I have to admit. That's part of the joy of preparing this. <laughs> now, what could narcissists, you know the myth of narcissists. I don't, and this is an audience that is well educated. If you don't know the myth of narcissism, then the Greeks have failed in their mythologies. Um, why does he fall in love with himself? Well, Corbin would probably say because he doesn't have a relationship with the nymph Echo. He could, he was beautiful, he was the most beautiful half-god that existed, more or less. And the nymph Echo, which is visible there, she sees him. Maybe in the same way as Christ looked at the incurved woman. But he doesn't look up. Well, there is only one result. He gets drowned in his own self-image. The interesting thing is, why does he get drowned? He can only get drowned because he doesn't even recognize that the image is himself, <laughs> to be fair. 
that's more something to think about. So, what's the solution? Oh my, that was too loud. <laughs> as well as if the heavens open. Um, <clears throat> how to get out of that predicament? You could say, well, then we need God. If we need a vertical dimension, we need God. We need religion in its ordinary way. But Coban said, no, there's something strange with, with religion, especially in an exoteric form and with ordinary theology. Namely, that God to which monotheistic religions pray is quite monolithical, if you think about it. It seems only to have one face for most people, the face they've been brought up to, most of the time an angry face sometimes. It is as if the divine intelligence is one and for all, for all human beings the same. And Corbin criticized that, not only in theological reasons, but also because most mystics don't talk about God in that way, either in Christianity, either in Islam or in Jewish monotheism. You have one God, but at the same time, any mystic will acknowledge that that God has infinite faces, specifically for the mystic who experiences God. I think part of that is clearly visible with the 99 names of Allah. That shows already that Allah has not only one name, but many names, infinite names, and that a name tries to point out a relationship between the nameless and the one who prays, the one who experiences God. So Corbin found comfort in the idea that God, the Deus absconditus, the hidden God, the deity, Meister Eckhart would say, the unknowable, makes himself known or herself known, presents a face, that face you could call the angel. That face is at the same time the embodiment of the archetype you really are in the divine mind. He found a very beautiful quote that confirmed his intuition in Islamic mysticism. And here we have a quote of Abu Barakat, who was a Jew, but converted to Islam. Let's read it together. The ancient sages thought that for each individual soul, or perhaps, interesting comment by the way, or perhaps for a number of souls with the same nature and affinity, there is a being of the spiritual world who throughout their existence adopts a special solicitude and tenderness, I like that word, tenderness, toward that solo group of souls. It is he who initiates them into knowledge, protects, guides, defends, comforts them, brings them to firm victory. And it is this being whom these sages, these mystics, called the perfect nature. That's a hermetic expression specifically. And it is this friend, this defender and protector, who in religious language is called the angel. So here we have a quote for a universal experience but very detailed described by Surawardi, Ibn Arabi, the sources of inspiration of Corbin, and less detailed described in Christian mysticism because Christ takes the place of that angel. And if you look at Christian mystics, there is not one mystic who experiences Christ in the same way. That's why Corbin says, what Christ is for all souls of light is each angel for an individual soul. Or to put it differently, each angel is the individual Christ for the soul, like Christ is the angel of mankind. <coughs> what Christianity has gone wrong is equating the historical embodiment of Christ in Jesus and the resurrected Jesus with that angelophony, which means that the angelophony disappears. And that becomes problematic for a lot of mystics because if, don't, if you don't experience Christ as he has been described in the Gospels, woo, then you become problems. While his incarnation, to come back to that question again, is already an angelophanic manifestation. Okay. So Corbin comments, each of us has to recognize his or her God the one in which he, she is able to respond. The angel is the face that our God takes for us and each of us finds his God only when he recognizes that face. And when we recognize the face of the divine appropriate for us, then the world will get a face too. 
and all human beings. That's why it's stated, love thy God, thy God, not a God, with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and then you can love your neighbor, because your neighbor gets a face then too, because God has expressing himself as a face to you. That's why the two commandments are one commandment. Loving your neighbor and loving God is really coexisting love at the same time. And here we quote a very famous uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> author, The Ascent. Hey, remember that cosmological scheme or, or, or getting straightened up. The ascent through the modes of being is the ascent of the self, our ordinary self even, toward the angel that defines his individuality. The status, and that's crucial, of personhood is not given, it has to be one. Personality is given, that's the result of conditioning. If you're born in China, in India, in Iran, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, you get a certain upbringing, you have your DNA, which already determines you in a certain direction. If we would only be that, the result of biology and nurture, science is right, specifically neuroscience, which is a field I'm dabbling in, more from legal interest than for scientific interest, then neuroscience is right. We're completely determined, don't have any free will. We are our brain, and our brain is conditioned by our upbringing, has its already its program DNA in it, and that's it. We are machines, and we have to look at crime as malfunctioning machines, and we can repair them. Get rid of the idea of autonomy, get rid of the idea of personhood, get rid of the idea of responsibility. That's a danger if you objectify man, even with the best of motives, namely to help man, in a way that leads to a complete reductionism. In order to prevent that reductionism, we have to become truly persons. And as Tom Cheatham says, that has to be one. Now, I think there is a famous image in the Bible, but you can find it throughout mythology, where you see such a battle. Jacob wrestling with the angel, for example. And the details are, again, very interesting. Jacob wants to cross a river. I forgot the river. It goes to back to the land of Canaan. And he meets during the night. It's always interesting when things happen during the night, in any event. A man. He doesn't call it really an angel. That becomes an interpretation later on, probably. And he wrestles with the angel. You know that, that story. He wrestles, he fights with the angel. He gets also touched with the hip, which may symbolize his own willpower and his own uh, horizontality, maybe. That, he, that, that, that hip gets uh, dislocated. And he says to the angel, I will not let you go until you give me your name. The interesting thing is the angel does not give his name. He renames Jacob. Jacob is then hence called Israel. He who fought with God. And Jacob calls the place where the fight was going on, Peniel. And that means the place where I met God, and now it comes face to face. From person to person. So what you could say in that image, again an event of the soul, we could all experience that at a certain moment in our life, such a battle. He has become a person. Jacob was already a personality. A good practicing Jew with some flaws, if you look what he has done with his brother, Esau. But there he becomes reborn and rebirth symbolized with a new name, Israel. The name that connects him vertically. Jacob does not have a vertical connection. You could explain Jacob purely horizontal. But Israel, the name says it all. He who fought with God. That name has only a meaning if there is God. And he fought with him. My preferable image, which I started the lecture with, is this one. Do you know from whom it is? I come from the Netherlands, Rembrandt. Rembrandt. It's not a famous painting of Rembrandt. Why do I like it? Because there's a tenderness. The, the previous one is really a fight, as Gustave Doré, and almost all paintings about the struggle between Jacob and the soul are violent. I was touched by this because it's almost, well, I hesitate to say it, but I do say it, it's almost erotic. It's at least a romance gesture. A loving, tenderness gesture. You see the surrender of Jacob, but also look at the leg of the angel. You see, he's not only holding 
with his hands is also his leg is also surrounding Jacob. I find that not only very endearing, but extremely powerful. And I don't see many artists who depict the struggle of Jacob with the angel that way, so tenderly. I think Rembrandt had, that's in the end of his life, and Rembrandt really had a change of his life towards the end, because he was quite egotistical in the beginning of his life. Uh, I think he had a core intuition. Uh, maybe it says also something about himself, but that's a guess. It's beautiful, huh? Ibn Arabi says about the angel and God, each being has as his God only his particular Lord. He cannot possibly have the whole divinity. That brought him maybe into some problems, uh, but he's still the Shaykh al-Akbar, the greatest of masters, both exoterically and esoterically. Here he says what I've tried to convey, what Corbin tries to make us aware of. We cannot know God as God completely in itself. That's Deus absconditus, the hidden God, the hidden deity. We can only know our Lord. That's why the Psalms constantly say, my Lord, my Lord. And Jesus says, ah, my father, your father. Even in the Old Testament, it's surprising that it's constantly stated, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It doesn't say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, it says three times the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That says something. It means that each of those three persons in that enumeration has what Ibn Arabi tells us. He has a relationship with his particular Lord. Now, if you not tell me that's polytheism, Corbin would say no. Polytheism means that there are gods who are creatures of the divine, just like men are creatures of the divine, and, 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 and animals and flowers. No, these are faces of God. God is fully present in each Lord, in each angel. Is that difficult to understand? Well, let me make a horizontal example. I'm here in a specific role and function, giving a lecture. I'm not making leek soup or teaching criminal law to my students. But nevertheless, there is a truth when I say I'm fully, I try to be fully present. David is fully in this role. Well, that's more or less the comparison. What Ibn Arabi wants to say is the whole divine is limited, but nevertheless fully present in each angel. Do I make myself more or less clear? In that sense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not three gods. No, it's one God showing himself and herself in many lords. And that's something else than polytheism. I think Corbin coined even a new word for it, catenotheism or something like that. The angel is the face that our God takes, says Corbin, for us. And each of us finds his God only when he recognizes that face. I already quoted that, but I find it beautiful to do it again. I still have 15 minutes, huh? So Ibn Arabi distinguishes, and the PowerPoint can be sent to you if you want, eh, so that you don't have to be worried, more relaxing maybe, if you would like to have these quotes. Now, I'm sorry that I didn't make a paper, but I, I, I'm used to talk around some pivotal quotes. So I end when the time is over, and, um, and we'll see where we get. Because I want to give Corbin all the credit as much as possible for this fascinating and necessary topic. Ibn Arabi distinguishes between Allah as God in general and Rab, that's the Arabic word for Lord, as a particular Lord personalized in an individualized and undivided relation with his vessel of love, which is the human being. And now Corbin says something that can be seen as really revolutionary for many people. This individualized relationship on both sides, so I stress the word relationship, as I already did, this individualized relationship on both sides, so on the side of God expressing himself as Lord and you as soul giving yourself to God. This individualized relationship on both sides is the foundation of the mystical and chivalric Chivalric, chivalric ethic 
of the Fideli, I made a, a typo, Fideli d'amore, the faithful in love, that's an expression that goes back to the Italian Renaissance and Dante, uh, the love with Dante with Beatrice, that's uh, symbolical for the love of the soul with the angel in the service of the personal Lord, whose divinity, this is interesting, whose divinity depends on the adoration of his faithful vassal, and who, in this interdependency, exchanges the role of Lord with him, because he's the first and the last. The last is an, a quote from the Quran, I think. So what this shows us is there is a mutual interdependency. It's not only that we need the angel, the angel has also a nostalgia, a longing to be embodied in us. And it is as if the angel can only become fully angelic in that relationship with his or her human counterpart. And we can only be fully human in our relationship with our celestial counterpart. And if you now ask intellectually, who am I? The human living here or my celestial lord and counterpart or heavenly twin, then you think that there are two who's instead of one who with two poles, a terrestrial pole and a celestial one. And that's the relationship. And it's the relationship that constitutes the two. It's not that the two only exist first and then you get the relationship. Do you find that difficult? Yes, me too. But we can find a horizontal example. And someone had to explain that to me, uh, 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 Philippe Moulinet, a French scholar, uh, well known in Corbin studies. He writes, imagine a mother giving birth to a child. What we are intent to forget that at that moment not only the child is being born, but also the mother. There is one event giving birth, that's a verb, that's being, not a being. Giving birth is not a noun, it's a verb. And that verb points to a relationship that comes into existence, the existence of mother and child. You don't have first a mother giving birth to a child. You have an event who gives birth to both at the same time. Now you can say, well, that's crazy talk. Because there is a woman there, I see a woman there in, in, in the bed giving birth. Yes, but you said it, a woman, not yet a mother. And she can only be a woman, even pure horizontally and sociologically speaking, from a gender perspective, in relationship within a certain culture and in relationship with men and other women. The more you think about that, you, you get that image of the web of Indra in Buddhism and Hinduism, where every pearl is connected with any other pearl. Every being is a pearl and in a, in a spider web like construction, every being reflects every other being. Maybe you're aware of that imagery. And only when you isolate a being out of its context, out of its relationships, you start objectifying him or her. Let me give an example of my professional life. I do criminal law. I'm not a criminal law pract practitioner. Uh, I like to teach criminal law, and as you know, those who don't know, teach. So, um, but I don't practice it. What I see happening the last 10 years increasingly is a complete demonization of criminals. That has always been a problem, but with terrorists, etc., etc., safety and security. And we have the victims on one hand of a crime, and we have the perpetrators on the other hand of a crime. Now, this has nothing to do with Corbin at first sight, you would think. But what creates the relationship between the two? A conflict, harm being done. The criminal and the victim are two poles of an event happening in society which we call crime. You don't have a criminal and then a victim separate and they get the relationship, a hurtful one, a painful one. No, it's the conflict that creates both. That's the same thing I want to convey here. Now apply that now vertically. There is not an angel for us, separate from us. Does that mean that the face, the Lord, does not exist separate from us? Yes, it exists, but in the mind of God. But it does not have an angelic function for us. So we don't create our angel by fantasizing about it. No, we have to become receptive to God so that God can show himself as an angel, our angel. 
I hope that helps a little bit. So that's why there is a famous hadith, sacred Islamic statement by the prophet, he who knows himself knows his Lord. Now we get that. Because himself is one pole, me, and my Lord is the other pole. So self-knowledge is not a solitary journey. Self-knowledge is by definition relational knowledge. I doubt knowledge. Again, even horizontally, let alone vertically. So, Corbin says, one cannot understand this relationship except in the light of the fundamental Sufi saying, he who knows himself knows his Lord. And again, the chivalry is back here because a knight is a knight for his Lord. And now this is complicated now. And I could only give this at this moment. So I may read it twice. Read with me. And I hope I don't speak too quick. Probably I do that. I'm not like those trees in, in the Lord of the Rings. The identity of himself and Lord, so of your soul and your celestial twin, does not correspond to a relationship of one is one, but of one multiplied by one. The identity of an essence raised to its total power by being multiplied by itself and thus put in a condition to constitute a bi-unity and made a typo. A dialogic whole whose members share their alternatively roles of first and second persons. Now, that's a complicated sentence, isn't it? As I understand this, but there may have deeper meanings, is what I already try to say. We are inclined to think either it's one plus one and we have two, that's my relationship with the angel or the angel with me, or we think it's the same. There's one self, Atma, they would say in Hinduism, and that is the same in all beings. That is true, by the way, from the perspective of Atma, or the divine. But then it would only be one is one. There is only one, and one is almost the negation of multiplication then. That's why he says the relationship is more one multiplied by one. Then you also have one. But a one that is increased in its oneness. I find that brilliant. <laughs> yeah, come up with that. Now, quantitatively, looking quantitatively, horizontally, you say, but that's the same thing. Any mathematician would say, this bollocks. <laughs> but it's true. You know, one is one, then you have one, and if you multiply one by one, you still have one. What's your point? You know, then you don't get it. We're talking here about qualities of being, and we are more one and the angel is more one, and God is even more one, through the relationship that is in existence. <laughs> and that's then the multiplicity that expresses unity, not negates unity. I find this, you know, when I read this quote, it took me three days to really understand what he's saying. <laughs> and I'm still struggling with it. There is a Greek word for that, zizigi. And I will conclude more or less with that later on. So he who knows himself knows his Lord. Com Corbin continues. You can still follow more or less? Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because if, if you want to go to bed or have a little <laughs> alcoholic beverage or non-alcoholic beverage, just tell me. Through the redemptive path of pure love, the mystic knows that he is the eye with which God contemplates himself. And that he himself in his being is the witness by which God witnesses himself. The revelation by which the hidden treasure reveals itself to itself. The last is a reference to that hadith where Allah says, I was a hidden treasure and therefore I created the universe in order to be known as that hidden treasure. What he says here, I read it again, through the redemptive path of pure love, that vertical love, which does not deny the horizontal love. That's why the closer Dante came to Beatrice, the closer he came to his angel. Through the redemptive path of pure love, the mystic knows that he is the eye with which God contemplates himself. That he himself in his being is the witness by which God witnesses himself. The image is almost as follows. And I get this now from Meister Eckhart, who says the same thing in different words. It is as if the heart is a mirror 
polished. And in Sufism, the polishing of the heart through prayer, through dhikr, is crucial, for example. And in Orthodox Christianity, the path I belong to, to the Jesus prayer. And when the heart is polished, it is as if God becomes embodied in the heart as the image in the mirror. But think with me, in accordance with this quote, that image looks back at the source of the image. So at that moment, I'm really reborn. The moment the Lord images itself in my heart, I'm reborn because the image to, according to which I made is the image in my heart that looks back at its source. Now, if you now ask yourself, are you then God? Yes and no. Yes, because you have become the image of the angel. No, because it's the image of the angel. If you ask yourself, has the angel become you? Yes, because the angel now sees itself from your experience in your heart, but it's not completely identical with it. You see the paradox? It's not a unity where the two absorb in each other. It's a unity where the two become more each other, which in my book is what a healthy relationship should be in the first place. So the eyes with which I look at God are his eyes with which he looks to himself. And his eyes are my eyes with which I look to him. It's a reciprocal relationship. And I think any horizontal love relationship has that too, if it's a pure love relationship. And that's why uh, our prominent guest says, the angel whose face we hope to see, and by seeing, also to be, is less an object than a relation. That's why I got it from, that you don't think I come up with these ideas. <laughs> there is the source. More a process than a thing. That's it. We have to leave substance metaphysics. We have to think in process metaphysics, more or less like Whitehead did to a certain extent. And we have to live phenomenologically. We have to take beings as they express themselves, and beings express themselves also angelic beings, but also animals, not as objects, but as subjects. And a subject is a relationship. I can advise you to buy, if you don't have it, the book of which I show you the cover. I think in terms of studies of an extremely high quality on this idea of the celestial twin, of our angel, of our divine double, is the book by Charles Stan. Really very good book. And a quote from him says, this view, which I'm now talking about for an hour, resists a temptation of a certain monism of the self. That is the notion that the self is meant to be wholly one. No, to assume that one is a single self is a form of false consciousness. The self is not half of the pair, yeah, the uh, earthly pole, either the I or its double, but rather the pair itself. Now I'm at the end of my capacities to try to convey something. Uh, it's the pair itself, it's the relationship itself, which constitutes our true identity. And it has an angelic aspect and a human aspect. And if we don't have that angelic aspect in our experience, Corbin would not hesitate to say we are not yet human. Biologically, maybe. Psychologically, maybe, to a certain extent, but definitely not spiritual. Here we see in Christian mysticism that same relationship. You can replace Christ with an angel, because in certain forms of Christianity, Christ is called the Christos Angelos, the Christ angel. And every mystic in Christian tradition experienced, therefore, Christ as his or her own angel. May not name it that way, because they are not having a theology like in Islamic mysticism. But the relationship is the same. I'm slowly going to my conclusion, if I may. The self is neither a metaphor nor an ideogram. It is in person, the heavenly counterpart of a pair or a zizigi. I mentioned that word already made up of a fallen angel, which is our soul, because we're living under the horizon. Do you remember that image? Under the horizon. Or an angel appointed to govern a body, and of an angel retaining his abode in heaven. So it would be, it, 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 it is as if before we're physically born, God 
in this Lord aspect remains in its Lord aspect in the heavens, in the Mundus Imaginalis, but it doubles itself. That's a word that Corbeil uses. It incarnates itself while remaining on its own plane. It gets bipolar and not in the psychiatric sense, but <laughs> I don't know why I came up with that bi bipolar. Um, that's the idea. And that relationship is called zizigi. I find that a, a, a nice word. If I would have a cat, I would probably call it zizigi. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have a cat. <laughs> yeah. But it's a powerful word, and I want to conclude with that. It's made from two Greek words, sin, together. Sin, not sin in the, sen in the sense of sinful, but sin, sin, and zigos. And it means joined together. In Latin, we would say conjugal. Conjugal, and that refers almost to marriage, to a romantic relationship, to having a spouse. So it's yoked together. Sisigo means yoked together, like cattle. Yeah, you have two cows, or how do you call that? And then, and then you're yoked together, yoked. Eh? Yeah. They remain two cows. It's not one cow becoming completely one with the other cow, and then you still have one cow. No. They are yoked together as a unity, but they remain distinct. Like two spouses or twins in the same womb. That's the deeper meaning of zizigi. And it's not a coincidence that in this tradition of Ibn Arabi, Surawardi, and Neoplatonists and Hermeticists, when they talk about our heavenly twin, our angel, they call it a zizigi. That's how they name the relationship. I was thinking about that, and it struck me only Two days ago, I was reading in the New Testament and I read a passage when Christ says, my yoke is light. And that immediately had a different meaning. My burden is light and my yoke is light. You know that expression? Maybe I quoted wrongly. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I mean, so there may be something deeper here. Think about that. What he's talking about is my relationship with you is really easy. Surrender. You know, it's not, it's not a duty imposed upon us. It's a love to which we are invited. It's, I still have to think about that. But I found that the word yoke, which you also see in yoga, has a, for me completely different meaning now with this notion of zizigi. And also another passage. I'm going to skip this because I really want to conclude. Namely, a passage that is so much used that it becomes superficial. I think it's even used with the, the, the burial of uh, Diana, Princess Diana. It's the famous letter of the Corinthians about love. That's translated, I think, in the St. James, but correct me if I'm wrong, by charity. I think that's a loss to a certain consent with the meaning that charity has in this day and age. The Greek word is agape. Now, love is a difficult topic. There are multiple forms of love. But I think most Christians are inclined to think that this is love as neighborly love, compassion, charity, practicing charity. I don't think many Christians interpret the word love here in the sense of that relationship with one's angel. And I have a hunch, but I have to explore that further on, that that could be a deeper meaning of that hymn of St. Paul, and I want to join me to read it, and then see whether my hunch may have something. And then I stop. You know it all. You know the, the passage. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy, and should know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. You know that passage. It's so well known. It remains beautiful, although it's used too much maybe. He doesn't say that you cannot speak the tongue of men or angels, that you cannot prophesy, that you cannot have all knowledge. He says... If you have all that, but not the love I'm speaking about, then it's all nothing. He's not saying, please be loving and stupid at the same time. 
He's not saying that. He's saying it's love that comes first. He continues. Love is patient, is kind, love envieth not, dealeth not perversively, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices with truth. And now there comes a passage which I find important in the context of the whole lecture I've tried to give and in the context of Corbin's insight. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the things of a child. So he's reborn as a man. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now there remain faith, hope and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And I've made in bold the things that drew my attention when preparing this lecture. This is a relational love. This is a love that Paul is speaking about, not of one infinite God towards all mankind, of mankind towards that infinite God. It's face to face. And he really stresses, then I will know that face, the Lord, the angel, which you could call Christ angel, as I am also known by him. And that's the same as Surawardi's beautiful poem. Thou, my Lord and Prince, my most holy angel, my precious spiritual being, thou art the spirit who gave birth to me, and thou art the child to whom my spirit gives birth. Thou who art clotheth in the most brilliant of divine lights, may thou manifest thyself to me in the most beautiful of epiphanies. Show me the light of thy dazzling face. Be for me the mediator and lift the veils of darkness from my heart. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you.